Well, you did it. You made it to chapter three in your study of college algebra. And in this section, we're going to talk about quadratic functions. Quadratic functions have some very telling little aspects to them. And the first comes from investigating the equation when it's in this form, ax squared plus bx plus c. One of the things that we can tell while looking at this equation is because it has a constant value and an x to the first power and an x squared, and that's where it stops, that means that the graph of this function is gonna look like a parabola. We can also tell that the leading coefficient, the lowercase a in front of the x squared, if that number is greater than zero, if it's positive, then the parabola we graph is going to be concave up It'll be shaped like a U, so to speak. And if the A value is less than zero, the, con uh, the parabola will be concave down. So it'll look more like a rainbow. The vertex of the parabola occurs at either its highest point or its lowest point. So we're gonna watch out for that. Uh, this author refers to it as the turning point. And a parabola, whether it's concave up or concave down, is going to have an axis of symmetry. So occasionally, when it comes to graphing, we will be able to use the fact that a parabola is symmetric in order to graph maybe one or two extra points in order to help graph our parabola more accurately. Um, if you have printed these notes, be careful. Sometimes when a PDF gets saved and moved enough times, uh, some things start to go wrong and get lost. This should be an equal sign right here, if you would. And these are actually parentheses right here. It's just a note that says that A is greater than zero and that that's why this parabola is concave up. Let's see if we ran into the same issue over here. Nope, the equal sign is there. Our parabola is concave down. Our A value is less than zero. Okay. In 2.5, we did indeed look at a series of transformations where we took the parabola and maybe we vertically stretched it or reflected it over the x-axis, shifted it around, but that basic parabola does have its vertex at zero, zero. And then we see this other form for the equation of a parabola. This is also a quadratic, and this is sometimes referred to as vertex form, but more formally as standard form. And one of the really nice parts about this form of the equation for a parabola is that you can identify the location of the vertex very quickly. So if you look at this equation, you're going to see that in the, the function, in the equation, there's a lowercase h and a lowercase k. As it turns out, h comma k are the coordinates of the vertex of the parabola. So if you happen to be given your equation, your function in this format, very easy to tell where the vertex is. If it's not given to you in this format and it's given to you in the other one that we saw, it takes a little bit of work in order to convert it back into this format but there's a shortcut that we're gonna see that will help us determine the vertex of our parabola, even if it's given to us in the other form, the first form that we saw, ax squared plus bx plus c. I'm just scanning through this, right? So let's look right in the middle of the screen, pretty much. This should say f of x equals zero. So the process for graphing a parabola is a multi-step process, and each one of these has to do with orienting it correctly and being able to plot a couple of key points. We already talked about if the a value is greater than or less than zero, it helps to determine concavity. You can find the vertex of the parabola, especially if it's uh, the parabola or the function is given to you in this form. H comma k is the location of the vertex, and then as with other functions that you've worked on, you can find the x-intercepts by setting y equal to zero, or f of x equal to zero, or in this equation, make the left-hand side equal to zero. 
and then you can find the y-intercept by plugging in an x-value of 0. And then you plot all of those points, and, and uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to do one of those in this lesson, and then we'll see if symmetry helps us at all. I mentioned that there's a shortcut, so if the function is given to you in this form, not so easy immediately to identify the location of the vertex. <clears throat> but what you can do is you can use the a and the b values from this form, ax squared plus bx plus c. If you calculate the opposite of b divided by 2a, as it turns out, that will be the x-coordinate of your vertex, the opposite of b divided by 2a. If you then take that x-coordinate and you plug it into your function, that's what's happening here, then you can generate or calculate the y-coordinate of the vertex. This looks more intimidating than it is. I think the thing you really need to remember is that the opposite of b over 2a is what you use to calculate the x-coordinate. As is always the case, if you need a y-coordinate, you plug the x-coordinate in. So hopefully that part will come naturally to you. And here's an example for us so we can do a little investigation, a little practice. Use the vertex and intercepts to sketch the graph of this quadratic function. Give the equation of the axis of symmetry and use the graph to determine the function's domain and range. So that's good. We'll get to revisit that topic. So this function is being given to us in ax squared plus bx plus c format, which means Let's actually, oops, let's write that down. f of x equals x squared plus 4x minus 1, which is following the format ax squared plus bx plus c. I would take all of that information and notice that that, that means a equals 1 b equals positive 4, and c equals negative 1. In order to find the vertex then, it is located at the opposite of b divided by 2a, comma, f of, whatever that x coordinate turns out to be. So let's calculate the x coordinate. The opposite of b divided by 2a equals the opposite of 4 divided by 2 times our a value of 1, and that is equal to negative 2. So that's our x coordinate. Now let's calculate our y coordinate by taking this x coordinate and plugging it into our function. f of x is now going to equal f of negative 2, which is equal to, uh, I'm going to go down onto the next line so that I don't run into my graph here, negative, uh, I'll put an equal sign there also, negative 2 squared plus 4 times negative 2 minus 1 which equals positive 4 minus 8 minus 1, which equals negative 5, which is our y value. So we have an x value of negative 2, a y value of negative 5, and we can plot that point as our vertex. If you want to put one more little note down here, maybe so, vertex at negative 2, comma, negative 5. Was that a, an explicit question in here? No, we're just trying to graph this. So let's plot that point right away. Starting at the origin, go left two units, down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units, and there's our vertex. Great. <clears throat> Now let's start working on, I think I'll switch colors, and let's find our x-intercept. As always, we'll find our x-intercept by letting y equal 0.
if y equals zero or f of x equals zero, however you wanna say that. Either way, the left-hand side of our original statement needs to become zero. So we have zero equals x squared plus four x minus one. Now, unfortunately, this, the right-hand side of this function is not factorable. If it were factorable, you would go through the motions in order to factor and you would come out with a couple of x values and those would be the x intercepts. Unfortunately, this one doesn't factor. Uh, let me just back up for a second. What I mean is if we could have factored this and turned it into zero equals x plus one times x minus three, then x equals negative one, and x equals positive three would have been your x-intercepts. However, this green equation that we have right here is not factorable. So you have options, you can complete the square or you can use the quadratic formula in order to find the solutions for this equation. I think I'll complete the square. Uh, you can put yourself a little note here. Solve by completing the square. Or with quadratic formula. And I'm going to complete the square. I'll start out by adding 1 to both sides. And then I'm going to take this number, the 4, divide it by 2, and square it, which equals 4. And I'm going to add that 4 to the right-hand side of my equation and to the left-hand side of my equation. So I now have 5 equals x squared plus 4x plus 4. And what that allows me to do is factor the right-hand side. Now that I have factored the right-hand side into a perfect square, I can take the square root of both sides. Left-hand side of my equation becomes plus or minus the square root of 5. Right-hand side is just x plus 2. And then I'll subtract two from both sides. And I have the two x intercepts, negative two plus the square root of five and negative two minus the square root of five. Now you'll pull out a calculator in order to do this, but be mindful that the square root of five is approximately 2.2. .2. So when we go to graph this, we're gonna It'll be a little a bit of a guesstimate, but we'll plot a couple of points. So these are our x-intercepts. So let's see about how, we, how do we plot these. Negative 2, so I start at the origin and I move left 2 units, and then I'm going to do the minus square root of 5. So that's to the left another 2.2 .2 units. So let's come in here. I've already gone to the left 2 units. And then, now let's go another 2.2 .2 units approximately. So that puts us maybe here. And then the other point was negative two plus the square root of five. So we have to add 2.2, .2, which will put us about 0.2 units to the right of the x axis. And my hope is that you're seeing the symmetry of what it is that we're creating here. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and leave that parabola there. It looks a little sharp on the bottom. It shouldn't really look like a V. It should have a bit of a curve at the bottom, but this is not rocket science, thankfully. The other thing that I'd like to try to figure out is my Y intercept. It might be that in an online question, you're asked to click on the Y intercept 
as one of your points in order to get full credit for the question. So let's go through those motions. And what do we think of this color? That's not bad. Uh, I'm going to come over here, kind of line it up with my X intercept. So I'll put Y intercept here. In order to find the Y intercept, we will let X equal zero. In other words, we're solving F of zero, plugging in an X value of zero into our original equation, which was X squared plus four X minus one. So now it's zero squared plus four times zero plus, oops, minus one. Now well, let's put it down here, equals negative one. So this is our Y intercept at negative one. And I'll tell you, we did a pretty darn good job. I'm still in orange, but that's appropriate because we were just writing in orange and our Y intercept is at zero comma negative one. The symmetry of the parabola. It is symmetric about a, an invisible dashed line called the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry is a vertical line that passes through the vertex. So let's bump this up a little bit. There is, with an arrow at the top and the bottom, that is your axis of symmetry. The equation for this axis of symmetry, if you notice every point on the dashed line that I just drew, every point, not even at the whole numbers, but all of them, every point on that line has the same x coordinate. They all have an x coordinate of negative two. That's how I remember that the equation for this line is x equals negative two. So again, that's the equation of the axis of symmetry. Now, symmetry means that we should be able to take anything on the left-hand side and fold it over onto the right-hand side or vice versa. I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna take my y-intercept, which is at zero, negative one, and I'm gonna fold it over that line, x equals negative two, and let's see where it lands on our parabola. Uh, let me get a, yeah, we, let's use the screen here. So I'm taking this point right here, my y-intercept, and my axis of symmetry is two units to the left. So I'm gonna take this y-intercept, two units to the left, and then two units to the left again, and I would be able to plot it there. Let's do it in orange. So our parabola should pass through that point also. So again, depending on the call of the question, especially if you're doing this online, make sure that you're clicking on the correct points. Drawing or graphing the correct parabola is not always the only requirement. Sometimes you must be clicking on specifically requested points in order to graph the parabola correctly. And that's how the software will know to give you credit for, the, for your answer and for your beautiful graph. Well, that looks like work. Look at that. <clears throat> okay, I think we answered all that. We used graph to determine, oh, the functions domain and range. Great, let's make a comment on domain and range. Any parabola, or any polynomial for that matter, is going to have a domain that goes from negative to positive infinity because there's no danger of division by zero, there's no danger of square rooting a negative number, there are no logarithms, so we don't have to keep our input value greater than zero. You can plug in anything you want. So our domain does indeed go from negative infinity up to positive infinity. Now the range. Sometimes I call it the list of output values. When you have a graph, which we do at this point, Think of it as all y values represented by the graph. And I always go from left to right on the x-axis when I'm thinking about domain, and from the bottom to the top, or lowest to highest when I'm thinking about range values or y values. 
So I start out asking myself, how low does my parabola go? And it does go all the way down to a point that has a y coordinate of negative five. So I come down to my range answer. I put my negative five. And since we do actually reach a point with a y value of negative five, that's going to get a square bracket. And then how high does the parabola go? It goes all the way up, heading off toward positive infinity. So those are your domain and range. Be careful of that square bracket. You need to include that. I've noticed that when I zoom in, my pen stays the same thickness. And then when I zoom out, it makes the, all of my markings look really skinny. All right, what else have we got? Maximum and minimum values. <clears throat> this is something that I have seen trip up a lot of algebra students. Uh, let's just glance at this blue box real quick. Uh, it's a PDF, so I'm making sure there are no typos. Nope, all the equal signs are there, good. So uh, we're looking at the function in this format again of ax squared plus bx plus c. So we've got the, the a, the b, and the c values. And if a is greater than zero, then you know that your parabola is going to be opening concave up. And what that means is that, or, or what we can extract from that fact, is that the parabola is going to have a minimum. In other words, it has a lowest point. When, or where is the lowest point? Well, it's the vertex, okay? Whether the parabola has a minimum because it's concave up, or it has a maximum because it's concave down, the minimum and the maximum always occur at a vertex. Now, when does the maximum or minimum occur? If you're asked, when does the minimum or maximum occur? You're gonna answer with an X coordinate. If the question is what, not when, but what is the minimum or the maximum, you're gonna answer with a Y value. How does this blue box articulate that? Uh, f of x has a minimum, minimum that occurs when x equals negative b over 2a, and the minimum value is f of, which is a y coordinate. All right. Mm -hmm. Here's another way to phrase it the, y, the value of y or f of negative b over 2a gives the minimum or maximum value. Determine without graphing, in this example, whether the function has a minimum or maximum value. Let's just start with that. If it's concave up, it's gonna have a minimum. If it's concave, it's so awkward. Concave down, I'm gonna stop doing that now. If it's concave down, it's gonna have a maximum. Is this parabola concave up or down? Well, the lowercase a value in front, the leading coefficient, is a positive two, which means that it's concave up, which means it will have a minimum. Some of you should be writing that down. Because a equals two, which is greater than zero, the parabola is concave up and therefore has a minimum. If you need to pause to finish writing that out or rewind to do that, because that's important, when does this minimum, in this case, when does this minimum occur? We need an x value in order to answer that question. We know it's gonna happen at the vertex, so let's try to find, well, let's, let's not try to find it, let's find it. Let's find the x coordinate of the vertex. x equals negative b over 2a, the opposite of negative eight, divided by two times our a value of two. So that is eight over four, which is two. Now we need to find the corresponding y coordinate. So we need to figure out f of two. That is two times our new x value of two squared minus eight times two minus four. And we are in the land of arithmetic. I've got eight here and I'm taking away two eights here, so now I've got negative eight, and I'm taking away another four makes negative 12. So when does the minimum happen? 
when x equals positive 2. What is the minimum? The minimum is negative 12. So answer A is going to get us full marks on that one. And this is just a little summary. So that is it for the first section of chapter four. Uh, most questions that you see pertaining to this topic are going to be very consistent with what we just went through. Sometimes you'll have to use the quadratic formula or completing the square in order to find those x-intercepts. Sometimes you'll have two x-intercepts that are nice numbers. Sometimes you'll have two x-intercepts that are lousy numbers, like the ones that we got. Sometimes you'll get two x-intercepts and they'll be the same. That happens when the vertex of the parabola is on the x-axis. And sometimes you won't have any x-intercepts because if your parabola is floating above the x-axis and it's concave up, it's not, it's not going to intersect the x-axis, okay? Uh, or it could be below the x-axis and concave down. So some different variations do exist out there, but the process is going to be the same. You'll just have to make some observations uh, in some somewhat unusual circumstances. All right, that's it. See you in the next section.